Detroit in bankruptcy court and the key things to watch for this election season in Michigan. My week gets started right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaround-plan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Welcome to My Week, and thanks so much for joining me. I'm Christy McDonald. Detroit's in bankruptcy court this week. Everyone is watching to see if the city can prove they have a viable restructuring plan. Holdout creditors argue the city gave retirees preferential treatment. A breakdown of what is happening in court and a look at what it all means coming up. And election 2014, the key things to watch for this election season in Michigan, plus special focus on the U.S. Senate race and new ads in the governor's race. That is just ahead for you. But we will start with a look at Detroit's historic bankruptcy trial in federal court. So let's check in with Sandra Svoboda. She's a bankruptcy reporter with WDET Radio and our partner in the Detroit Journalism Cooperative. She is at our Midtown studios. Sandra, it's good to see you. Welcome back to my week. I know that you have been in court all week following this trial. So I'd like to start with just give me your general impressions of how you think things are setting up here. Well, I would say my first impression has been that everything is taking longer than expected. We've gone into the third day for opening statements, and I think most of the attorneys have gone longer than they told us they would in making their really what amounts to opening arguments on what they think of the plan. And so basically they're, they're lining up saying, we don't believe that this restructuring plan that the city has come up with is, is a good one. Well, that's what the creditors are saying. Remember, we also got three hours of opening statements from the city's lead attorney, Bruce Bennett, who told us why the plan should be confirmed, the strengths of it, what it does to, and he said, save the city of Detroit. We also heard from the Detroit Institute of Arts attorney about why the DIA agreement, the grand bargain that we've all been talking about for so long, why that is so important to the city, not just the museum, but the pensioners as well. And we heard from an attorney from the Retirees Committee, representing all of the 32,000 retirees and employees who is also in supporting of uh, who's also supporting the plan then we're getting the creditors uh, the county the three counties in southeast michigan a couple of unions and of course the bond insurers that we've talked so much about who are objecting strenuously because they literally have hundreds of millions of dollars at stake here we're setting this this all up and it's expected to last about at uh, seven weeks or so so if you're if you're sitting on the outside and watching this and we know that we're saying that this isn't a historic proceeding what exactly are we looking for to come out of this well, ultimately, we're looking for a thumbs up or a thumbs down on the city's plan of adjustment. That is sort of the blueprint, the guidelines for how the city will restructure its debt and reinvest in city services. One of the big issues for the judge and, and how he'll decide on that is whether he thinks the plan is feasible. In other words, are the financial projections reasonable, and here he'll, he'll hear a lot of testimony on this, are the financial projections reasonable for what they're estimating, for example, pension interest return to be, for what financial projections for tax revenue for the city will be. And also on the side of city services is the $1.4 billion that the plan has to reinvest in technology, infrastructure, public safety, all across city departments, city services, garbage collection, blight, trash pickup, bus service. Is all of that a working plan that will make life better for the citizens of the city? And once we get to the to the really to the end of, of this, the judge has a decision to make. How long could he take to make that decision? Well, that's up to him. We've seen in other cases where negotiations have, have gone on. Um, Stockton right now, for example, is is still negotiating within their plan. So uh, we don't really know when the, the judge will make his decision. He's certainly given indications so far that he's taken this very seriously. He started questioning some of the attorneys during their opening arguments. So he's, he's not just sitting back and letting everyone present their case. He's actually involved in some of the questioning. All right, so we know that some witnesses are going to be taking the stand over the next couple of weeks. What would you tell people the highlights for what should we be looking for? 
Well, definitely Kevin Orr taking the stand is going to be going to be interesting. We've already seen in opening statements parts of his deposition played where he actually contradicts what other witnesses said in terms of what documents were prepared and how the city prepared the plan and prepared its case. So that one is definitely going to be, I guess, a showstopper if we can use that terminology for a court case. We also get Mayor Duggan and City Council President Brenda Jones who are expected to testify about the real feasibility of the plan. One of the issues is, is there buy-in from city leadership to execute a plan that was done by an emergency manager and an outside team of attorneys? Now, by all accounts, they're working closely with city officials, but the judge definitely wants to hear that leaders of the city will make the plan work going forward. All right, Sandra Sabota from WDET, where you're going to be blogging uh, this entire trial, and we'll have the, the link to that on our website at myweek.org. Thanks, Sandra. We'll see you. And joining me now are MyWeek contributors Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press and Nolan Finley of the Detroit News. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. Good to be here. All right, in the beginning of a historic uh, week here with Detroit, finally in, in bankruptcy court, as Sandra was filling us in on everything. So how is this being perceived around the rest of the country, Nolan? Well, I think there are a lot of places that are looking at following Detroit down this path. And I, th I think they're giving it uh, a good deal of scrutiny to see just how uh, how much pain is involved in the process and and what uh, you know what penalties are extracted on a community and if you look at the Detroit experience I mean and you're a municipality who's got a load of debt no way to pay it off you know you look at what's happened in Detroit you might say hmm you know that's not been so bad here I might try that of course we haven't seen the final settlement yet but the pain for Detroit hasn't been anywhere near what we thought it was going to be do you agree when with, this started. Do you agree with that, Stephen, that the pain hasn't been as painful as it could have been? Well, it's, it certainly hasn't been as bad as uh, other cities that have already done this. You look at the two California jurisdictions that went into bankruptcy. I mean, they had an awful time. Uh, it took a long time for them to come up with their plans of adjustment, which, you know, Kevin Orr put together for us in under a year and has in front of the court. Uh, it took them a long time to reach settlements with a lot of their creditors. They ended up selling off uh, public assets, which you know Chapter Nine has even written to try to prevent. Uh, it, these were they were not good experiences uh, for those communities, and even post bankruptcy, they've had a lot of a lot of problems. The, the the contrast here, I think, is is defined almost in the in in Kevin Orr and this whole idea of bringing in a bankruptcy expert to manage the bankruptcy, mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody who understands the courts and the, the, the way it works so that, uh, so that you don't get stuck in, in some sort of malaise uh, like some other places did. But that is sort of Sincora's point in this whole argument this week that, you know, the city hasn't really bled much here and it hasn't, it had certainly hasn't sacrificed as much as it could have in yeah. terms of coming up with the money to settle its debt. And I think that's at the crux of this of this uh, argument in the court this week is did the city really do what it needed to do to raise the money to pay off the money uh, the money it borrowed and you can look at Sincora and say well gosh you know they're holding this up and they're the bad guys here but you know they're being asked to take six cents on the dollar and you know, what do they got to lose? Well, and, and I think they even said in court, they said, well, that the, the magic term would be maybe 75 cents on the dollar. And that's, no which is that that's, that's, that's really magical because it's not going to happen. But you, you can, you know, you, you can see where they might have a case that six cents on the dollar when the city really hasn't um, explored other options for raising money may not be a fair settlement. Well, but, but remember what the test is here, uh, and the judge has been pretty explicit about this th throughout, that the test is uh, not uh, expending sort of, you know, short-term resources and coming up with short-term fixes that will help creditors, not doing things that will harm the city's ability to deliver services better on the backside. Uh, and so that's what, that's what Sincora is up against, is the idea that if you give them 75 cents on the dollar, what's left? For the people who live here, yeah, well, and that'll I, require a tax increase and some other things that uh, the court seems to have no appetite for. Yeah. But other cities have faced those choices. They have. I mean, but you talk about that, and that's going to require a tax increase because I think people are looking down the road, saying, "Okay, we're going to we're in this historic trial. Seven weeks from now, or ten weeks from now, we're going to emerge from it. What is the city going to look like? And will the city be in that good position to be able to move forward and keep up, I guess, the the, the clean slate that they have?" A lot, you know, that's a lot of unforeseen factors. We'll answer, we'll answer that question. Is population going to continue to decline because if population keeps declining, revenues 
go down with it. And so you're, you keep chasing water down the drain, really. So it, it depends on a lot of other factors. Are we able to stabilize the neighborhoods? Are we able to convince people that better days are ahead, stay put, we'll fix services, we'll make this a safer place? I think they're making pretty good progress toward that, that goal, but there can't be any hiccups. And does the plan, though, that the judge has in front of him, Stephen, when he looks and says, okay, this is a viable plan for, for the city, how much, I guess, leeway does he take for those moving parts for, well, it says that the city should be able to do X, Y, and Z in two years from now, right. but there could be some change to that. Well, some of it has got to be uh, about faith, right? I mean, he's got to have faith that, that the elected leadership uh, in the city and at the state level. I mean, uh, this idea that, that somehow Detroit will be set off on a lifeboat on its own uh, after bankruptcy is, I think, a, a, a little um, fantastic, too. The state has a role to play in funding the city. You know, uh, cities all over Michigan have the same problems uh, with, with the way that the revenue sharing has just sort of collapsed. Um, and, and then in the city, you need the mayor and the council to, to manage and do the things that they say they're going to do in this plan. Uh, but then you also need nothing to go wrong, right? Another another big dip in the in the national economy uh, could, could the housing affect market. Revenues, the housing market. Yeah. But one thing, Steve, I mean, Detroit's not going to be a ward of the state. I mean, the state has no, taken extraordinary measures over the last several months to get Detroit to the point where it can settle its bankruptcy and have a shot at a viable future. But if they're looking for this, this ongoing lifeline well, to need, the city, to the state treasury, it's not going to happen. But you it? need reinvestment in some pretty critical areas. And the governor has been doing that in terms of law enforcement, bit. blight, yeah. lighting, other things. But Detroit can't, is not going to be dependent on, on the largesse of the state because the state's got its own problems. And cities all over the state are facing similar circumstances. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's really interesting what you brought up, Stephen. You said there's got to be a little bit of faith here, which kind of goes against everything when you're talking about bankruptcy court <laughs> and looking at <laughs> measuring things up against legal standards and, and making yeah. those types of decisions that faith has to enter into this as well. Well, I mean, he's got to believe what they're telling him. I mean, it's one thing to look at the numbers and say, okay, well, this all adds up or uh, it doesn't. And one of the things he signaled uh, yesterday was that there's not enough leeway in the numbers. There's not enough reserves. Uh, in case something does go wrong, you need more cash. But, um, but he's also got to just, at the end of it, he's got to look at it and say, okay, I believe that, that the leadership in place can actually pull this off. Um, and, you know, we all have to take that leap of faith. I mean, uh, you know, we elected uh, Mike Duggan and the new council uh, to, to fix the city after the bankruptcy, where the real work actually uh, begins. So, I don't know. Uh, we'll see if they do it. But Last word on this, Nora. There has to be discipline, too. I mean, there's going to be a pool of money now coming into the city that wasn't there before. Bit, yeah. And when you talk to start talking about reserves uh, and rainy day funds, that's not the, something the city's ever dealt with before, at least not in recent money. And there's going to be a lot of hands pulling at, at all Trying this to get new this money to, to, you know, to get give give backs on concessions that have been made restoration of benefits that have been cut it's going to take a lot of, of discipline on the political leadership uh, part to keep that money from you know being squandered as it has in the past we will continue to be trial watchers of course all updates you can find at myweek.org well it's officially on labor day usually signals when campaigns ramp up so it's time to talk about the biggest things to watch for this fall in michigan's elections including spending in the u.s senate campaign debates or lack thereof new ads in the governor's race so i was very excited for us to all be together <laughs> um, today to talk about this because once we hit Labor Day, now it's on. And we have a bunch of things to talk about in terms of elections. So I would like to start big picture first. And give me a sense, and Nolan, I'm going to start with you, the biggest things to watch for that now we need to in, in the Michigan election cycle. Well, I think the biggest thing to watch for in both of these races, if they, if they stay close, just how much outside money is, is going to come in here. Because you saw this week um, in the Senate race, Tom Steyer put $3 million in behind Gary Peters, that's an indication that they think, you know, this is going to be a decisive race and that it's still close. I think as long as the polls um, stay close, you're going to see just unprecedented spending in both these races. Talking about 50 million for the Senate race, 40 to 50 million for the governor's race, two races consuming $100 million of spending and probably 70% of that 
coming from outside from the state's outside, borders. Yeah. It shows you just how much is at stake in, in these elections. All right, Stephen, what about you? Big things to watch. I think the money is uh, still yeah. the same thing, but I also think the the defining of the candidates beyond the, the ads, I mean, I think uh, in the case of all four candidates uh, for the governor in the Senate race, there's a lot of sort of gray around them in terms of uh, either who they are or what they want to do uh, that that I think the the ad process of course is just making even murkier because the, the ads are all you know already so over the top and full of you know half truths or, or just outright lies um, but but all, all these candidates have a lot of work to do defining themselves for the voters if you look at the things that people are saying in the polls they don't really know uh, they don't really know what what any of these people want to do in the in these jobs, and that includes the governor. So you're saying that most of the ads that we've seen so far are negatively defining the Somebody other else. candidate, sure. right? That we're not seeing these image ads from from the candidates about who they truly are. You're seeing a little of that, but they get lost, and you know, I I I, I just don't think these candidates are really going to get a chance to define themselves. Why? Because of that level of spending. When you have three and four million dollar ad campaigns coming at a clip uh, where it's you know painting these folks as the worst people who ever climbed out of the slime I don't know how you counter that and how you get your message through and I worry that voters uh, sometime soon here just gonna turn it off and say man we can't yeah. listen to and, this anymore and, you know and, and and the real un the, the real unfortunate uh, factor or dynamic here is that I think the candidates don't see debate as a way to define themselves, and I think they used to. I think that uh, it used to be more universally accepted that that was the way you uh, sort of carved a, a space for yourself uh, in the campaign and told people who you were, and, and you don't see candidates now embracing debates quite the same way. Okay, so before we get on the debate topic, um, let me go back to just what you're saying about ads. So you're saying that most of the money that we're going to see funneled into these races, and we're talking specifically about the governor's race and the and the Senate U.S. Senate race. race, is all mostly negative. It's going to be predominantly negative. That's what you've seen so far. I mean, we up until this point, we've seen an unprecedented amount of, of spending in these races. Remember, neither one of these campaigns uh, had a primary election. And yet we've probably seen 10, 15 million dollars or more spent so far in each of these races. And it has been, the, the biggest part of it has been So when negative. you fear, when you fear though that, that voters get turned off, do you think then they see the negative ads and it doesn't register and then, so therefore they say, I can't make a decision so I'm going to stay home? No, oh, I, I don't think you'd see a lot of people say, I think we're going to have a big turnout in, in November, but I just think uh, people stop listening to, to the negative ads at some point because uh, they just sort of go back and forth and, and it's, you know, uh, they, get, they get more and more ridiculous, it seems, uh, as you get closer to the election. And look, look at the $40 million per, that's been spent <clears throat> so far and where the races were when all that spending started and where they are today, place. they haven't moved the, the numbers at all. So you have to wonder, you know, what's another seventy million going to do in terms of of swaying people's opinion? You've got a lot of spending. It's going to make you it don't so have there's a lot of movement. Every there's a there's an ad in every commercial break of every show. Yeah, you're and be somebody's watching. going to try to find that magic bullet ad. You know that uh, the that, scandal ad, right? Yeah. You you want the ad that 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 where you can reveal something about your opponent that true that, or not that voters did not know uh, and that that changes their mind so I think it's very interesting they're talking about the majority of the spending are going to be going towards negative ads but yet you're saying they don't move the needle in terms well, of changing people's they, opinion they yeah. may move or they the needle, haven't, they haven't so yeah. far yeah. they haven't so far all right let's talk about the debates um, there was supposed to be a, a debate on the west side of the state with the governor um, at a television station there and also a senate and those have been suspended because they they could not get confirmation from Governor Snyder or from Terry Lynn Land uh, Stephen, you talked a little bit about the fact that candidates aren't seeing that debates are important for their message anymore. Why do you think that that is? Well, I mean, I think that in every race you have you have one candidate who has nothing to gain uh, by by getting on a stage with the other candidate. In this cycle, it happens to be both Republicans, uh, and I think that's notable. Uh, but but it could easily be the Democrats, right? I mean, if the Democrats were in the same uh, position, they would also be sort of balking at at and have. these debates, and it's happened before. Uh, but but the bigger the bigger issue here is that voters and their interests are completely lost in this process. The campaigns see debates as 
uh, as part of their self-interest uh, and their and their campaign as opposed to a public service. Uh, and so if you're Rick Snyder and uh, you feel like uh, getting on stage with Mark Schauer gives him legitimacy uh, that he can't get on his own, then you're going to you're going to hem and haw and and delay to you know run the clock out so uh, uh, so to speak before debates get scheduled. If you're Terry Lynn Land and you don't do very well in public, uh, you're sort of stammering and uh, got a little bit of stage fright, you, you maybe you think you don't have very much to gain uh, by, by getting on a stage with Gary Peters, who's a little more polished in that forum. So. And, and the, the other thing, too, is the, debate, the debates themselves have become, in a lot of incident, incidents, just another gotcha game. Everybody's looking for that they don't um, have to one be, moment to pause. They don't have yeah. to be, but that's what they become. And perhaps it's time to rethink how debates are done. I mean, we've got new technologies out here different ways to reach voters. Maybe there are virtual virtual debates. Maybe there are um, better places than the candidate's own website to go and get uh, you know objective information about these candidates to help voters sort through the noise so that they're not, you know, that the debates don't, don't just become an extension of these negative campaign ads where instead of people standing up there and talking about their positions, they're trying to score points and yeah. and reiterate well, but, the points. Well, but let's go back. The points of their campaign but let's go back. Let's go back four years ago mm -hmm. uh, when when Rick Snyder was uh, just a candidate uh, for the governorship and and uh, uh, Verge Bernero was the opponent. We had a debate here, uh, the only debate uh, between the two of them that I had. I had real problems with the way it was structured and the rules that both campaigns tried to put on it. But don't you but think that's end, part of the problem? Is how it's become so yeah, sanitized right. and so and but so in the end, oriented. In the end, I think voters got a very. Well, you could watch that. <laughs> that's right. Because well, hang those. on, pat ourselves on the back <laughs> for just one moment. No, but I mean, I think voters could have watched that and gotten a very clear picture of who those two candidates were and what their positions were. Yeah, but that, and a lot of that went to the fact that the candidates conducted themselves. They, they absolutely well did. And, and, and in a very respectful fashion. And they were interested in getting their ideas out. Yeah. But how many debates have you seen where the, that becomes simply a an extension of the campaign well, advertising? That's the fault of the Where the candidates, then. sometimes, but where the candidates are simply trying to get their sound bite in. Well, I, I think that that's part of campaigning and that's part of running for public office. It is. And, and in this but, world that everyone now is trying to get their message across, regardless of the question that's that's been asked them. And you guys know that better than, <laughs> right. better than anyone. So and let and me that's ask you, what makes debates probably less useful than they were in a, at a previous time. So let me time. ask you this. So, all right, I'm going to pull out the whiteboard here and mm -hmm. start throwing things out here. What should we be seeing? If you're talking about something that we should be doing that's more high tech, um, involving citizenry in a, in a different way, I mean, let's let, let's start the brainstorming I think, right here. Again, there ought to be a there ought to be a series of debates that's scheduled by some independent uh, independent of the campaigns uh, body that that manages the discourse uh, for these things. And again, if all of the media outlets in the state cooperated in that process, I don't think the candidates would ever be in a position to be able to say, I won't do that. Would you say that there's there, uh, there's obviously ego of the of the candidates, but there's ego of the television stations and newspaper outlets well, as well, sure. or who yeah, want to have the the we, debate is that part of the problem we made an effort to try to get something like this together what was that two years ago um it didn't it didn't work it it, it snagged on on some of the things you're talking about well, it was our fault not the candidates fault it was not the candidates fault it was the, it was media outlets where where we couldn't convince enough people uh, that there was a public service value and all of us working together uh, to do this that uh, but, so so what if you take a non-media entity say like the political leadership program at MSU yeah. and said you're now okay. the de facto debate commission um, set it up yeah uh, you pick that may be a better route. But, you know, you you pick the the location, you pick the stations, you pick the moderators, and then the candidates are expected to come. But you know, you've got all this bargaining going on. Makes it almost it's what happened in Grand Rapids. Well, and that's well, and you could rotate. You could rotate impossible. it fairly as well. You could, you could you could say every you know two years or you know, the, some station gets this or the that. The problem with the process now is that the candidates manipulate media outlets, right? I mean, yep. everybody wants the exclusive debate. Uh, and candidates know that, so they'd sort of play around and say, well, we'll give it to you if if we get X, Y, or Z uh, from you. I mean, it, it's, it's a horrible process, and, uh, you know, I, I've said this before, but Indiana 
which is just next door, has a process that seems to work wonderfully. They have not ha had a, a statewide uh, uh, campaign without a debate since 2007 with this independent commission they have, uh, and they have had multiple debates in places around the state for every race. It's not that hard, uh, but it, but it, the, holding together the coalition that does that uh, is is the key. And then, right. you know, the next challenge is getting voters to actually watch them. To, to watch them. To sure. watch them and be engaged. All right, we're going to have to leave it there on elections, but you know we've got a good, uh, <laughs> a good two we'll months to go. We'll be talking about it again. That is going to do it for my week. Thanks, Nolan and Stephen, and thank you for watching. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter, and as always, myweek.org. For coverage of the election this year, also check out myvote.org for stories and candidate interviews. I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great weekend. We will see you next week. Take care. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michiganturnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.